All right, everyone, welcome. Um, just before I start, I just wanna say we might have a special guest, my dog. I'm home with my dog, Otis, and every now and then he likes to make a cameo. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today. I'm Janine, uh, the events lead at Meetup, and today's event on uh, why entrepreneurs should value community uh, with our special guest, Jeff Buskang. He is the author of the, uh, the Community Playbook for Founders. Jeff will be sharing Excuse me, Jeff will be sharing some takeaways from his new book. He'll also share what he learned from his extensive research on community building with the dozen of startup founders that uh, he interviewed. He will also discuss key strategies to shaping a narrow target persona, defining a community focused uh, business objective, crafting community engagement plan, and understanding what community success looks like. Before we get started with Jeff, I do want to go over some guidelines and the agenda for today. So this event is going to be recorded. However, you will not appear on video, so do not worry. You will not be on video. Um, like I said, the event is recorded. You can catch the recording of this event on our blog, meetup.com slash blog. However, it will not be available probably for like another uh, couple of days. Um, everyone is also muted. Everyone, everyone is also muted um, with the exception of my dog and myself. Uh, everyone is also muted. so. Don't worry that your mute button isn't broken. It's just, that's just what we do. Um, and we encourage you to please ask questions. If you have any questions, please ask them. Uh, please submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And also closed captioning is available for this event. You can turn on, you can turn it on at the bottom of your screen. Just click on the live transcription icon uh, and select your preference. Next slide, please. Um, so for today's agenda, I'm going to introduce Jeff in a few minutes and Jeff will then take over and uh, show his presentation. After that, I will ask the questions. Yes, the puppy does like to talk a lot. Um, after, afterwards, I will ask the questions that you all submit in the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of, of your screen. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jeff and then he will take over. All right, Jeff, so uh, Otis wanted to say hello as well. I'm sure you heard him. Uh, so Jeff Buskang uh, is the co-founder and general partner of, at Flybridge Capital, a seed stage venture, venture capital firm based in New York City and in Boston that invests in entrepreneurs across a range of sectors who leverage the power of community. Jeff is also uh, a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, which he just mentioned, that's where he is. Uh, where he teaches a popular course to second year MBAs launching technology ventures. Prior to co-founding Flybridge, Jeff was an entrepreneur serving as an executive in two successful startups. You Promise, did I say that correctly? You Promise, which was acquired an open market, IPO. Um, Jeff has authored two books on entrepreneurship, Mastering the VC Game and Entering Startup Land and holds a BA in computer science from Harvard, as well as an MBA from Harvard Business School. And Jeff, I'm going to let you take it away. All right, great. Well, thanks so much, Janine, and thank you everyone for joining me to chat about community, a topic I'm super passionate about. If you're wondering where I am and what's behind me, just to give you a bit of a view, I'm in my uh, office at Harvard Business School, and you can see my students. This is the way that we professors cheat when it comes to trying to memorize the names of our students. We put them up on these massive screens exactly in the spot that they sit in so that it allows us to memorize their names. Of course, this year, there's not a lot of memorizing of names on seating charts going on because we taught the entire semester and really the entire year over Zoom. Uh, not exactly the best way to deliver the case method, but we've made the best of it uh, here at Harvard. So the, the mission today in these 35 minutes or so is to try to distill for you the work and research I've done on leveraging community as a competitive advantage. And I'm very self-conscious in delivering this talk to the meetup community. It's very meta in that regard, because obviously the meetup community is itself the most interesting of all communities and platforms in which fostering strong communities can take place. But in my research, both from my lens as a faculty member in the entrepreneurship department at Harvard Business School, and also through my lens as a venture capitalist, um, as Janine mentioned, where we've invested in a lot of community-based companies over the years, I've learned and, and distilled 
some of the lessons on how founders in particular can leverage community as a competitive advantage. And I've written about those lessons in a few formats in an article from Harvard Business Review that hopefully can get shared in the chat and in a, an ebook that I just sent in the chat, which is a more detailed description and playbook for leveraging community as a competitive advantage. But I'm gonna to try to distill all those lessons in these 35 minutes to you all with a few slides and then we'll have conversation. So let's jump right in and share my screen. So what I'm gonna to try to do is, and, and I know this is an audience that's very susceptible to this argument, but I'm gonna to try to convince you um, that, that community isn't just something that's a nice to have uh, element of your strategy that makes you feel good or allows your customers to feel good about you. Instead, community can actually generate a massive amount of value. And I show you these two examples to drive that point home because I think they're very emblematic of what I mean. Airbnb, which is a company worth over $100 billion today on the public market, and VRBO essentially had many of the same strategic elements. Now, many of you have not heard of VRBO or HomeAway. All of you, I assume, have heard of Airbnb and know about the value created because Airbnb was very, very intentional in creating community around their business and around their platform. Similarly, Peloton, it's just a piece of equipment at its core, but they've generated a massive amount of value because they've been very strategic about creating community around their service, community of athletes, community of competitors, community of fitness enthusiasts. And so community is not just something that, as I said, you can think of as an overlay or an, an, uh, an additional element of your strategy, but can actually be very core to your strategy and can yield a very spectacular outcome now more than ever. And it's the now more than ever that I wanna really take a minute to talk about because this is a new phenomenon. And one of the things that we ask ourselves as venture capitalists is we often ask ourselves the simple question, why now? When we look at an investment opportunity, we ask ourselves, why now is this opportunity available when it had not been available five years ago, 10 years ago, and maybe it's not going to be available in 10 years from now, but why in this moment in time is this investment opportunity available. And community as a competitive advantage and as an investment theme is available now for three simple reasons. One, humans are craving community now more than ever. The uh, political uh, writer Robert Putnam wrote this beautiful book, Bowling Alone, 10 years ago, talking about how Americans more and more are hunkered down in their communities and lowering their involvement and engagement in civic activity church membership is down, volunteerism is down. Instead, Americans are receiving personalized content, personalized video, personalized information, and, and are very lonely. And they're not just Americans that feel this way, but globally, people, as they have more personalized information, feel more disconnected. The second thing going on right now is that there are all these incredible new platforms for creating, managing, and scaling communities in a far easier fashion than ever before. In the B2C business to consumer context, you obviously see that with social networks, but maybe less obviously in a business to business context, you see that with platforms like GitHub or Slack or some of the Asana tools that allow businesses to now convene, to allow employers to now and employees to convene and create community in a very frictionless fashion. And then finally, there is a tremendous amount of competitive pressure that companies are facing that forces them to look for new ways to attract and retain customers. It's too expensive and too crowded to use the traditional channels. And so you have these three forces, this craving for community, these incredible platforms that are now available, and this intense competitive pressure all kicking into gear before COVID. And then COVID hits and we have this global pandemic where people are craving community even more, hence why hundreds and hundreds of you are joining these meetups. 
And it's an incredible moment for companies to form communities around themselves. And so that's why we wrote this ebook to help teach companies how to form an engaged and passionate community and to build an ecosystem. And we talk about four elements on how to do that. And I'm gonna walk you through those elements. First, formation and engagement of the community. Second, leveraging community for product feedback, experience and support. Third, embedding community into the business model. And then finally, figuring out a way to do something that people have been very loath to do and it's been very difficult to do, which is measure the ROI for the investment in community. Now, before I jump into these four elements, I just wanna say as a caveat that this is a conversation that's very commercial in nature. And I'm gonna give that to you unapologetically. If you're looking for communities to have impact, I'm super supportive and passionate about those in my civic work. That's not this conversation. This is really a conversation about entrepreneurship and business opportunities in the context of community. But I have given this talk and spoken to many social entrepreneurs and civic entrepreneurs, and they have found some of these elements to be very relevant for them as well. And so no matter what you're doing, if you're a founder or a joiner of a startup, or even if you're a social entrepreneur or even a big company executive, I hope you'll find some of these elements and some of these lessons of interest. And in fact, I'm gonna show you a nonprofit example just to drive that point home. So let's jump in and first talk about formation and engagement of community. And there are three critical principles of community building that all of our research has distilled down to. If you wanna form a community and do it effectively, you need to focus on the who, set clear objectives, and create a set of engagement activities. Now focus on the who, what does that mean? What I mean by that is have a very tight definition of who you want in your community, begin with a narrow definition, and then make it more narrow still when you're just getting started. And create what we call in the startup world a persona, you hear that term often in the halls of product management uh, operations and startups and tech companies, a persona, which is the embodiment of who you're trying to reach and begin with a more narrow view that you can expand over time. And one example I'll give you is one of our portfolio companies, this company Chief. And I, I'm curious, throw it in the chat, if any of you have heard of Chief, and if you're even a member of Chief, I'd be very curious because Chief began only a couple of years ago to be a YPO for women. So a young president's organization, which is a global network of young uh, presidents that use craft sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning to help advance their careers. Chief founded by two fantastically talented women in New York City said, we need a special executive network for female executives who want to be together, who want to be in cohorts of peers that they can learn from and advance their careers. And this insight had a big vision. They wanted to reach all the executives, all the female executives in the world, but they had to start small to begin, narrower and narrower. And you see these circles that I, uh, concentric circles that I show here, that yes, they want to get to all women in the world, but they want to also Let's you know, bring it down, sea level women in the US. Well, that's maybe too broad. How about sea level women in New York City? Well, that's a quite large population. How about sea level women in New York City who are in the vertical industries of retail, media, or technology? Now you've got a population that's tightly defined and that you begin to focus on as part of your community formation and engagement exercise. And that's why you need to be very narrow in the beginning because community members want to be with each other with like-minded people. There's this psychological dynamic that all humans have called homophily, which or homophily, which is that we all want to be with people naturally that are like us. And that, that's not a comment necessarily about race or gender. It's a comment more about chemistry and values and like interests. And so having a, a notion of a narrower and narrower circle allows you to take advantage of this psychological powerful notion of homophily. 
And if you look at uh, what Chief has done, they've really crushed that, con that concept, as I mentioned uh, later when I talk about them and the impact they've had. So once you've defined the who, now you have to focus on the why. Why should this community come together? What are your key objectives? And prioritize them. Think about, um, you know, what is it that the community can expect to get from you? Uh, can they get product support? Will they get new customers and to advance their business? Um, will they get innovation and feedback insights? Uh, or is the community itself a part of your product? So really think carefully about why after you think about the who. And by the way, the why is informed by the who, like in product management discipline 101, once you've defined your target customer, then you can think about their requirements and their priorities. Once you've defined the who and the why, then laying the groundwork for community success requires the following seven elements. And some of you have asked, can we get this presentation? Um, we will post it. And in fact, I might ask you to post it, the link, um, if I may, Cindy, if you haven't already, into the chat for this presentation so people can download it and view it at their leisure afterwards. But the seven elements for community success are as follows. First, you need a shared set of purpose and values. The community needs to feel as if they're aligned, particularly from a value standpoint. Second, it has to be very easy to get value out of the community. Uh, there's a, a phrase in software product management we refer to as immediate and obvious benefit. When you download a product or when you first experience a product, you need to immediately and obviously see the value. And it's the same with community. Third, um, you need to be able to create value easily because what propagates a community is when members create value and create and contribute content. Fourth, a well-constructed set of incentives and rewards. Uh, uh, Janine mentioned that I was an entrepreneur before co-founding Flybridge and going to the dark side as a venture capitalist. One of my startups, you promised, was a loyalty platform. It was basically frequent flyers meets 401k, uh, helping families save money for college. And the thing that really taught me about uh, in that journey is the power of incentives and rewards in driving behavior. And so thinking about incentives and rewards is an incredibly important element of your community construct, uh, construct and, and, uh, and design. Uh, fifth, you have to have accountability. Members of the community need to feel a sense of accountability to each other so that they behave in the appropriate way consistent with the values. Uh, six, they have to have good leadership to support diverse participation. And finally, a clear and open set of governance, a clear set of rules. So now let me come back to number one, purpose and values. The thing that we talk about when we talk about community and whether you can hit all seven of these is when we look at that first one and we say, look, would this community pass the laptop sticker test? The laptop sticker test, all of you know it immediately as I say it, when you walk into, back when we used to walk into coffee shops and uh, campuses and uh, cafeterias and corporations, you would see what stickers are on the laptops. Is GitHub on the laptop? Is one of our companies, MongoDB, on the laptop? Is a certain brand of surfing or a certain kayaking brand on the laptop, like Jackson? Why would those stickers be on someone's laptop? What is it that compels someone to put a, a sticker of a company or of a brand on a laptop? and God forbid of a database software company like MongoDB. Um, that is the laptop sticker test. Does, does the member of the community feel so aligned from a purpose and value standpoint that they associate their identity with the community? That's the power of putting all of these elements together. You asked about um, more about crafted accountability, Patty. Um, just to hit on that before I leave this slide, accountability to a community means that you're going to behave in a way that is consistent with the values of the community. You're going to contribute and do what you commit to if you commit to delivering a certain amount of value. And if you don't, you're held accountable. Now, that accountability may be through a demotion in your rank from a public rating standpoint. Uh, for example, Atlassian has a ranking system for the members of their community that teach other members of the community 
uh, about their products and hold gatherings and meetups. Well, if you're to achieve a high rank, there's a certain level of responsibility that that involves and entails. You need to deliver a certain number of meetups and have a certain level of expertise. Uh, and if you don't achieve those, then you can't get to the higher ranks. That's the sense of accountability. Just a funny sidebar, Atlassian, when you achieve the top rank, number five, they hold a party for you, a virtual party. One of the co-founders comes to that virtual party and the community does a roast for that individual who's reached the top rank. And they bring back old materials from when they were in the lower ranks and tease them for how inexperienced or uh, uh, unsavvy they were about the Atlassian community. And it's apparently an incredibly fun and well-received uh, roasting event. So that's, these are the groundworks for success. And when you, when you have those groundworks, you can see it all in action. And this is an example from a nonprofit that I'm on the board of, an educational nonprofit called Facing History in Ourselves. And the reason I love this example is this is pulled from their presentation. So this is a nonprofit that services teachers with a curriculum focused on civic education, uh, looking at case studies like the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide and the civil rights movement and studying those case studies to help think about lessons of identity and social justice today. And they work with teachers and think about their teachers at different levels of engagement because teachers can take their curriculum at the bottom level and just be aware of facing history and use their materials and incorporate it into a, a high school English class. Or they can move all the way up the level of engagement where they have a full implementation, a full on course called Facing History in a high school near you where they implement the entire curriculum. And what's cool to me about this chart is in addition to showing how you get to different stages and what the activities are, is you see these arrows that indicate that teachers can move from different stages at different times, and that's okay. What's cool about this is it shows that community development, it's not a sales funnel. You're not at the top of the funnel and then moving your way down the funnel and then getting spit out at the end. Community and defining stages of community is more like a, a virtual circle. Sometimes a community member might be at the center and sometimes they might be on the periphery. It just depends where they are in their journey. And that's okay. As a company, you don't wanna force people through a funnel. You instead wanna engage people wherever they are. You wanna meet them where they are, as they say. So that's a, a really interesting element of community formation and engagement. So now the second um, element, and I, by the way, I'm gonna take questions at the end. I, I see some people in the chat, which I love because it allows me to see where you're interested in, um, but I will take questions at the end. But the second element that I wanna to touch on is around designing the community for feedback, experience and support. Because what you wanna do is leverage your community. And again, I said at the beginning, for commercial purposes, you wanna leverage your community as a product development resource. Sometimes you want the community itself to be the product, certainly to support itself, answer questions and provide peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. And then also think about where you wanna fit into the organization. Where does that community organization fit? And I'll give you just three quick examples of companies that are doing this in a very powerful way using their communities for customer discovery and product development. And the first one is SoundCloud. SoundCloud actually assigns community leads out of their community management team to product teams. What that means is that embedded in the product team, when the product team is meeting and having their cross-functional reviews of requirements and priorities and customer needs, there's a community leader in that meeting assigned to that product team, voicing their opinion based on their knowledge of the community. It's a very powerful notion. Secondly, John O'Bacon, who wrote this book, People Powered, and was my co-author in the Harvard Business Review article that you saw in the chat about community as a competitive advantage. John o writes in his book, and I know some of you may have even come to his talk, John o writes that you wanna actually lean into critical feedback. You wanna solicit critical feedback and use that from the community to inform your product development process. And if you're a product leader in a company that has a strong community, you don't move forward with new initiatives until you really solicit the input of the community and you look for the heat 
you look for the spots that are the most controversial and you try to address those. And then finally, HoneyBook, which is a small startup, mid-sized startup, focused on providing a business platform for small uh, business owners, bookings and payments and bookkeeping and record keeping. Um, one of the executives there is a former student of mine. And she was telling me that when the pandemic hit, they stopped their roadmap. They just threw it out. And they said, let's go to the community. We want to save these small business owners. This is our lifeblood. Let's ask the community, and in particular, the community leaders, what should our roadmap be? What can make your life better? And so that is a complete reorientation of your product development roadmap centered around your community. Now, I told you earlier about Chief, the executive network for women focused on career development. What's magical about Chief is that the community itself is the product. In other words, the network is the community, is the product. And in my business of venture capital and in my studies of entrepreneurship at, at Harvard Business School, we talk a lot about network effects. And many of you know the power of network effects, that the value of the network increases exponentially as the number of members of the net, that network grow uh, and increase. Chief is a network effect business. The value of your peer-to-peer -peer learning network grows as the number and quality of that network grows. And so what's cool about Chief, and I'm sure many of you can think of other examples, LinkedIn I see in the chat is mentioned and there are many others, uh, the community itself is inherently where all the value comes from. Now, if you wanna build community into your organization, where do you put it? And this is a question that founders and CEOs are asking themselves more and more today. It's really fun to see the innovation, organizational innovation that startups have yielded. There was a time when business operations or biz ops was an organizational innovation. There was a time when growth as a function was an organizational innovation that startups generated. And now you're seeing community management as an organizational innovation. And people are wondering, where does it fit in? And in my research and in my experience, you're making a strategic choice when you decide, just like with growth and just like with biz ops and just like with product management, when you decide where does it sit? Should community report to the marketing function? In which case it's very outward facing and very uh, uh, entrenched in the idea of generating leads and revenue generation, or should it report to the product function in which case it's much more focused on product development, product discovery, product feedback and support, or is it so strategic that it should be elevated to an executive position and report to the CEO? Either way, when you staff the community function, you need to make sure you have all of those skills, all that cross-functional capability, support skills, content generation skills, very strong social media skills now more than ever, branding PR, and most importantly, a very high emotional IQ to engage with customers effectively. Once you've decided you want to make community a strategic focus, you've formed the community, you've engaged it, you've decided where it fits in, what the construct and the rules of the community will be, one of the questions that you have to ask yourself is, how does community fit into my business model? Importantly, how do I know how much to invest? And for me to explain that, I wanna just take a step back and share with you a deconstruction of what is a business model. And this is gonna be a little bit of uh, uh, HBS 101. In these five minutes, I'll try to deliver $70,000 worth of value in explaining what the components are of business models and how network effects and then community effects fit in. So first let's talk about what is a business model for a startup look like? There are four key components to start up business models. One, the customer value proposition. What is the differentiated value that you're delivering to meet an unmet need that the customer has? Are you solving a pain point or a problem that the customer has? And what is that value proposition? Second, what's the product delivery model or the technology operations model that allows you to fulfill the value prop? What is your solution, in other words, and how are you delivering that solution? Third, how do you go to market to attract customers? How do they become aware of you? How do they know that you even exist and how do you acquire them? And fourth, what is your profit formula? 
how do you make money? In my class at Harvard Business School, one of the things I teach is that startups are experimentation machines and that you want to progress through each of these elements of the machine somewhat in sequence and run experiments against each of these elements. So first you figure out your value proposition, iterate on that. What's the problem I'm trying to solve? Do I have the right problem? Do I have the right customer? Is it important enough to them? Then you figure out if you can deliver on that problem. Then you figure out how to sell and scale and repeat, make it repeatable and a scalable sales model. And then you figure out the business model and the, and the profit formula. And one of the things that's so magical about startups is that venture capitalists who are complete idiots, I guess, we fund that whole cycle. So you can lose money through steps one, two, and three for years and years until you figure out step four, the profit formula, once you've nailed the value prop, the delivery model, and the go-to-market. And that's why we see so many companies exist in the private markets before they go public and before they have to be profitable because investors like me fund that whole cycle with the belief that when you get to the end of the rainbow, you're gonna create a lot of value. What's interesting to me is how community fits into that value creation. So let's talk about another case study to really bring home this idea of network effects, which is Code Academy. Code Academy is a network of learners, community of learners. Uh, 50 million to date have used their platform and their content to learn how to code. It allows the non-technical folks to learn all the way up to the very serious professional developers. In fact, I'll be very curious if any of you are Code Academy customers or ever have been Code Academy customers, let me know in the chat. Uh, I, I'd love to hear uh, who of you have taken some of their early uh, introduction to SQL or front-end development or any other um, elements of their product. So Code Academy, although it seems like an online education platform, it's really a community. That's what's so powerful about Code Academy. It's a community of learners that meet and share their best practices in Slack. They share code snippets. They evaluate each other's code. They have events um, where they um, talk about code. Uh, learners mentor the novices. And so you build in this amazing network effect into what normally you would think would not have a network effect. And all because of the power of community. So communities, I assert, supercharge network effects. And I would say Meetup is an example of this. You know, Meetup is an example of an entity where the community itself is the product and the community itself supercharges network effects. And Scott Heiferman, the founder, has this great quote, you know, community members show up for the meetup, but they come back for the people. That they retain that sense of loyalty because of the power of the community. And I mentioned LinkedIn earlier. LinkedIn, I think, is one of the most amazing network effect businesses. Because once everybody is on LinkedIn, then they have to be, you, you have to be on LinkedIn. What they did recently is they've layered in community functionality. The notion of sharing posts and videos and following your friends and commenting on their content and congratulating them on their latest professional accomplishments, that all brings community in a really powerful way um, that didn't exist before when it was just a resume um, listing. So how do you measure community ROI? And then a couple more slides and I'll wrap for, for Q&A. So you can't manage what you can't measure. How do you actually commit to or make the argument for investing in community and getting resources to staff a community function or invest in community oriented events if you can't articulate an ROI? The sales organization's articulating ROI. The marketing organization is articulating ROI for their investments. So how does community do it? Well, I would argue the community ROI, what I call the CROI, is very similar as a formula to marketing ROI. You just look at the value you gain from the community, from the investment in community, minus the cost, and divide that by the cost. And so you can show financial impact through many different ways. That value can be demonstrated through an increased sales pipeline, increased deal size because of the community, greater product adoption, more successful upsell or cross-sell or faster product adoption, lower support costs because the community is supporting itself and your staff doesn't need to be as large, 
or added features that provide competitive advantage. These are all ways that you can show positive financial impact thanks to the power of community. And the one example, just to bring this home, I'll give you is Atlassian. Atlassian is an Australian-based software company. Some of you may use their products to help with project management and tracking of development projects. An incredibly successful, successful company that's been brilliant at community. And I gave you the example of the levels that they've created. I think they're one of the most sophisticated community-based software companies. Their community team is more than 10 people. So they've really invested heavily in a department of community leaders. And here's how they think about ROI. They say, look, every time we do a community event, we generate some free trials. In fact, for everyone that attends a community event, 81% of them ask for a free trial. And of everyone that comes to a community event, eventually nearly a th over a third of them purchase the product. So that's really interesting. Now you've got a sense of a conversion rate. So you take your average revenue per customer, which in the case of Atlassian is $6,000. And you look at the gross margin, the 80% in their example of that revenue, that's gross margin or real profitable contribution. And that, so that's now $4,800. You divide that by your purchase uh, uh, percentage to get a sense of what the value is that you're generating uh, for each of your customer acquisition. And you see that for every incremental attendee, you can generate over $1,600. And it only costs you your customer acquisition cost of $100. What that means is that you have 15 times return on your community investment. Now this is theoretical, but if you and I were sitting in a boardroom and somebody presented to us that their investment in a certain area of customer acquisition and customer engagement was 15 times, you would double, triple, quadruple the budget. You would tell them, what, what can you spend efficiently? Because let's do more of that. And that's what's happening throughout organizations if they can measure the ROI on their community investment. So let's bring it all together and then bring it to a close. You need to, really focus on when you're forming and engaging the community, think about the who, have it be a very narrow definition, a narrow persona, define your business objectives, and really think about how do you define success. And that sets your agenda. You then set up your community for feedback and experience and support so you can leverage the community as a product development and product support resource. You can then architect your business model to take advantage of what I refer to as community effects, which are the community network effects to turbocharge your network effects or add network effects that maybe didn't exist. And then finally, measure the ROI to justify more spend, to get the flywheel spinning as you think about continued investment in community. So that's my quick overview of community as a competitive advantage and the playbook for founders. As I said at the beginning, it's a really unique moment. We believe at Flybridge to invest in community, to leverage community as competitive advantage. And I hope this talk gave you a few elements to think about and consider when you embark on that journey. And with that, I will stop and turn it back over to Janine and her wonderful, charming dog and take some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, right now, the wonderful, charming dog is in us talkative, and let's hope that he stays that way so that it's just me speaking. Um, and, and you, of course, answering the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for everything that you shared. I, It was really funny when you mentioned the stickers, uh, because if you look at my laptop, it's full of stickers. And I think that was really interesting because you get so many, but only, so, only a few, a select few, make it onto your laptop. Right. So what, if, if it's not too personal a question, what are the stickers that have made it to your laptop as an example? Sure. So I obviously I have some meetup ones. Um, and then I have one from, uh, I think it's called the Financial Gym. Uh, it's, it, it's like this service that helps women with their finances. I know. I'm like financial literacy, especially for women, is like a really big thing for me. Um, so yeah, those are the ones that have made it. But again, like I collect so many and they just sit there.
Yeah, that's the and laptop also, sticker chat test, right? Like if you can, as a company or a brand, if you can break through to the, uh, get, have people put your laptop, your sticker on the laptop, it's very powerful. Yeah, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. Thank you. And also thanking you, uh, thank you for helping us save $70,000. Uh, <laughs> really appreciate it, but we have a ton of questions. So I'm gonna get started on the questions. Uh, and if I'm pronouncing this name wrong, I apologize. Villas asked, how would you recommend to attract new members to communities? Yeah, look, I mentioned earlier about value proposition. You have to have a strong value proposition for why they're gonna to come to the community. And as I said earlier, you wanna be very narrow in who you target. So let's say financial literacy as Janine articulated before is something that she's passionate about. Maybe you target a geographic group or an age group or a certain psychographic or demographic Pick a, pick a really narrow group and then try to convey to them a compelling value prop as to why they should join the community and what value they'll get out of it. Maybe it's peer-to-peer -peer learning, maybe it's friendship, maybe it's companionship and a sense of belonging, maybe it's a sense of identity and a values alignment that they wanna associate themselves with, but look for ways to articulate a value that even go beyond your actual product is what I would really focus on. Thank you, Jeff. Um, something else that I wanted to say from like everything that you mentioned, yes, this is for entrepreneurs, but really like any organizer can benefit from everything that you said. Any organizer that's looking to start a meetup group, right? Or is looking to start anything like these are, you know, these are like the frameworks that you need to get started and be successful at what you're doing. A hundred percent. Look, value propositions. We're all busy. There's a lot coming at all of us, a lot of distraction. And that's why cutting through with a sense of belonging and purpose is so powerful and articulating a value proposition that grabs the person, the target that you're trying to attract for their valuable time. I mean, 450 people joined this meetup because they're interested in being a part of the meetup community and they're interested in the topic. And so how do you think about the combination of content and value with community and sense of belonging to cut through the noise? Thank you, Jeff. All right, so question from Rob. Rob wants to know, Jeff, can you talk about the ethics of leveraging community? Sometimes I feel guilty. You know, I'm so glad you asked that, Rob, because I mentioned at the beginning my caveat that this was commercial. This is a commercial conversation. I'm a, a business professor. I'm a venture capitalist. This is all very focused on yielding value creation. And yet I would tell you that the members of these communities, as I said earlier, when I made the reference to Bowling Alone, the book about loneliness, the members of these communities, they have choices. They have other things they could be doing with their time. They have other ways they could spend their money. They're here, they're in these community environments because they view there to be a very profitable value exchange for them. And so to me, you're not doing anything nefarious by leveraging good techniques to deliver a lot of value to your target customer. In fact, hopefully that value exchange is making their life better or providing some solution to a problem that they have that no one else is solving. So in many ways, I think, and I, and I, and I confess I'm a capitalist, so I'm, I'm very biased in my comment here, but I think that you can harness the power of capitalism and business to do good. And I think building communities is very much a step in that direction. Thank you, Jeff. I never would have guessed that you were a capitalist. Um, I'm being so sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> Diana wants to know what are what are sample incentives for nonprofit communities or learning communities? What well, I didn't what are I didn't hear the first part. What are sample incentives for nonprofit communities oh, or learning communities? And I great. know that John O'Bacon talks a lot about incentives, so. It's a great question. Look, because you're not delivering a product per se, right? In fact, many times you're asking them to contribute to you. And so it's really about this powerful notion of a sense of belonging and feeling like you're fulfilling a purpose. The reason Facing History, the educational nonprofit uh, that I'm on the board of and the example I gave, the reason Facing History I think is so effective is that people associated with and tied to that nonprofit feel that they're making the world a better place, that they're contributing to the educational system of the country, that they're contributing to a sense of greater justice. And that in and of itself is the reward. So 
as a nonprofit and even a for-profit, if you can have people feel like they're fulfilling a part of a mission, a personal mission or a, 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 purpose, a sense of purpose that they care about and are deeply invested in, that can be a very powerful uh, and effective way of getting people to contribute to nonprofit and civic communities. Thank you, Jeff. Next question, I told you we have quite a few questions. Uh, Richard asked, I noticed that establishing credibility in the community is not part of your seven point strategy. Where does it fit? Yeah, it's a great point, Richard. I think, you know, credibility is important. It almost underlies everything, right? Because both the company needs to have credibility that they're going to be a good steward of the brand and of the community. You know, if the meetup organization were run by a bunch of folks that had values that were not consistent with the meetup community, you would have this you know, impedance mismatch or this incongruous dynamic. Uh, you don't wanna have cognitive dissonance. You wanna have harmony between the leaders and the values and the community itself. And so credibility of the leaders as, as humans, as, as personal leaders is I think so powerful. I think we're in an era right now of personal credibility in a way we've never seen before. And I think social media and other more open and transparent platforms are allowing people to really derive a sense of belonging and value from the leadership. That's why narrative commerce is so compelling. What I mean by that is we all want to buy products that we want to know the stories behind the products. Is it a founder whose values we believe in? Is it from a, a sustainable supply chain? Uh, I, one of my former students is founder of a company that's building a synthetic palm oil. She's using the greatest advances in, in synthetic biology to, to manufacture synthetic palm oil so that we don't have to cut down trees and have deforestation, which is one of the greatest um, uh, problems in carbon emissions and a huge uh, issue in many, many countries in Southeast Asia and in uh, South America uh, and, and a huge labor issue from a, a quality of life standpoint. And so she's really compelled by this mission and sense of purpose. And when she markets her product, it's all about the story, the narrative behind it. So I think we're in a world where narrative commerce, stories and credibility really stem from the founders and from the founder's vision. I, I think that also goes for Meetup, right? Because when you talked, when you talked about Scott, uh, and about meetup and community like that's exactly it's the same thing right like his story with why he started meetup um so yeah uh thank you for that uh it was good it was it was a good connection <laughs> good. um so alex asked you mentioned don't i love this question by the way don't force customers through a sales funnel but if you want them to engage more as a member or actually join as a member what do you suggest to avoid there being static yeah, I mean, look, and by the way, somebody asked about um, the book and she said she'd buy it, which is super nice, but the ebook is free. So I'm gonna just put it in again in the chat. So, you know, you don't want a static relationship. That's completely right. You want there to be dynamism. You want it to stay fresh. And the way to do that is deliver fresh value, fresh content, fresh people, fresh opportunities to contribute. Um, we, we are all bombarded as I said earlier, with distractions. This is the attention economy that we all live in. Everyone is vying for our attention and you have to stay fresh and new and continue to generate new ideas and improve your product. One of the reasons I push my students when they think about lifetime value, I say, don't think about beyond three years because you can't tell me that if you stand still, you're gonna be able to retain customers for more than three years. That's just not, it's not credible. Uh, don't, don't base your formulas on 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of lifetime value, because you're going to have to reinvent yourself every three years. And I think that's been true in my career. That's true at my firm. Um, at Flybridge, we've tried to reinvent ourselves every three, four, five years. I think that's true in any organization. And it's particularly true if you want to retain a community. You've got to reinvent yourself. You've got to stay fresh every few years. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely part of being innovative uh, and, and keeping up with the times. Um, Avnish asked, speaking of communities, how can we create a safe space for community members, not just success stories, but also failures? Link LinkedIn, for example, is not a safe space to share failures for most of the members. Everyone is comfortable to share their success stories, but not failures. Your thoughts, Jeff? Yeah, it's such a great question. And, and we talk about this a lot in my 
family with my young adult children who are ages 18 through 23 and are in that generation where they're just transitioning from the Instagram Snapchat generation to the LinkedIn generation. And they're beginning to become professionals and what have you. And they've been trained in the Instagram you know, culture to only uh, show their best lives and not be candid. But they've been trained in the Snapchat culture to be very candid and very open and honest because the pictures and the Snapchat, the chats are ephemeral. So how do we create an environment where people can be candid, as you said, a safe space? And I think in truth, you can only do that if you're with a community that's smaller and smaller, where you feel more and more comfortable being vulnerable. But in the larger communities like LinkedIn, no one's gonna be comfortable being vulnerable. It's just not reality. No one's gonna be comfortable being open about their failures and their faults. So I, I believe, in, and this is a bit of a theory we're talking about in Flybridge, that there's going to be a next wave of social networks where smaller and smaller communities get together. And you're seeing this with Clubhouse as an example, which is one of the, the hot new social networks that's an audio only platform for people to have conversation. And those conversations are not recorded and it's a narrow band of communication, but you can have honest conversations with people. And I think Cheap is an example where you have these peer to peer learning groups where you can be very open and very vulnerable and very candid about your struggles as an executive trying to rise up and advance your career. And those conversations are not recorded and they're not publicly displayed. So I think this idea of sub-communities and private communities and narrower communities being created while still benefiting from the larger communities is what we're gonna to see to allow for more vulnerability and, um, and safe spaces. And I hope we can, I hope we continue to see a lot more of that uh, after the pandemic. Amen. Yeah. Um, Fiona asked, we have an established presence in one marketplace, but are launching into a new market and a community is something I want to do. Would you recommend doing this from the start as we launch or later on? Look, I think you should be embed community right from the beginning. I think you should think about who of your and early customers are going to be really dedicated evangelists. And what value can you provide them to be propagators, to be spreaders, uh, to use a viral term we're now becoming very familiar with, to be super spreaders of your, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh, we know, we know the term and not in a good way. <laughs> right, right. But to be super spreaders of your idea and of your concept and of your values and your brand. So I would embed community right from the beginning. It's also critical to do it for your own culture because you want your product leaders and your business development leaders and your engineering leaders and your customer service leaders to be thinking about your customer community and building an ecosystem around your brand and product and platform from the beginning, not something as you tag on at the end. Thank you, Jeff. Jill asked, how do you suggest handling the 80-20 effect where only a small percentage of the community members are actively engaged in sharing stories, ideas, and experiences? Can there be too many observers and not enough doers? So it's a great question, but it's really a pattern we see everywhere. It's an open source pattern. It's a contribution pattern on websites and content sites. I see it in the chat. We have you know 500 people here, but probably only 50 or 100 are doing uh, comments in the chat or in the Q&A. It's, it's just very natural that you're gonna have some members of the community be consumption only, lean back and, and passive. And that's okay. As long as you have that 20% that's engaging the other 80%. So the key is, do you have good engagement metrics to determine whether the 80% are switched on and engaged or are they switched off and not really there, they're ghosts. And one of the things we talk about in, at Flybridge is, you know, avoiding vanity metrics. When founders come into us and tell us about their downloads and their installs and their signups, we say that sounds very nice, but that's kind of a vanity metric. How many people are logging back in at every week and every month? What are your monthly active users? How many people are moving up what uh, venture capitalist Sarah Tavel refers to as the hierarchy of engagement, performing the action that you want them, the core action that you want them to perform, and then spinning the flywheel that you want them to spin? So those are the kinds of things that you need to really think about when you look at measuring the non-active, obviously active members of the community. Are they disengaged or are they engaged but just in a way that's comfortable for them? Thank you, Jeff. 
I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Veronica asked, for a sole proprietorship specializing in mentoring individuals, what is the ideal number of community members to manage and work with to start? Wow. I think that's a question that depends so much on every business. If you're a business to business sole proprietorship like an agency, you may only have 10 or 20 members of your community. If you're a Shopify store and you've got thousands of users, you may have thousands of members. One of my companies is Flair Jewelry, which is run by two spectacular former students who wanted to make sure that women in college campuses and young women felt safe at parties and at events. And so would have a piece of jewelry that would link to their phone that would create an ability to have a signal go off if they were in an uncomfortable situation or have a call come to them that allowed them to gracefully exit a situation um, or have a GPS location for an extreme situation. The whole company is run by uh, these two founders. Everything else is outsourced. They have one other employee and they have thousands and thousands of users. Uh, and so, you know, I think in this world and this era where you can leverage platforms like Shopify and leverage platforms like GitHub uh, and leverage platforms like Facebook and Instagram, you can build very large communities as a sole proprietorship. There are plenty of examples of influencers on YouTube or on TikTok that have millions of engaged community members, hundreds of thousands, and they're really just a sole proprietor. So I would think big and ambitious when it comes to leverage uh, as you amplify your network and build your community. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for answering all those questions. I have a question for you. You've mentioned a few times that you've worked with your students, right? A, a company a student started. How many students have you worked with? Over you my, know, yeah. Started over, their own companies. I mean, they're very lucky. Yeah, well, I, I'm the lucky and one. I'm, right? I'm asking this question, Jeff. I'm like, wow, that's 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 great that you do that. It's cool. I, I'm, I feel lucky because I learned so much from them. Over my 10 years of teaching at, at Harvard Business School, I've had 1,500 students take my class. And um, I've invested in probably 30 or 40 of them and uh, at, when, when they're graduates. Uh, and, uh, and it's been incredibly, <laughs> it's been incredible to see. I, I bet, yeah, it must be very rewarding. Okay, well, before we go and say goodbye to Jeff and everyone else, I want to share a slide really quickly. And I'd like to ask for everyone to pull out their phone and scan the QR code for our podcast that launched uh, early this month uh, with our CEO. It's called Keep Connected with Meetup CEO, David Siegel. Please scan the QR code. We uh, launch a new episode every other week. Uh, the past week we had an episode with Edward Zia who is an organizer of Meetup. And as uh, Jeff mentioned with a friend also, uh, he's also a friend of ours, uh, John O'Bacon. Um, so please dial in so that you can listen to uh, David talk to community leaders and organizers, as well as community experts. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for dialing in today. Jeff, thank you so much for this. Um, as we mentioned before, you can catch uh, a, cop, a, video, a recording, sorry, a recording and a recap of this event on our blog at meetup.com slash blog. We will also share the links there for Jeff's book. Uh, for the slides that, that he presented today, as well as the HBR article that he mentioned. Again, thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Jeff, thank you so, so much. So many great learnings. It was such a pleasure. Thank Otis would say goodbye, but he is tired. <laughs> thank you so much, Janine. Great to see everybody. Thank you. Bye.